places that um, uh, allows us to um, to do different things. So uh, instead of looking at our samples, we quantify our samples and we um, retrieving different type of data. Uh, we're going to talk about flow cytometry and cell sorting. Um, and uh, also, um, also here, I'd like to give you a, a minute of uh, introduction of the history and evolution of the systems. Because as, uh, flow cytometry is, uh, as I said, it's very similar, but uh, it's much, much a younger technique compared to microscopy. Uh, it was invented in 1949. Uh, based and it was based on the on the need of separating two different populations of uh, of um, of ions and uh, and it was used the the electrical charge to to separate the different uh, different type of particles by size uh, regardless the shape and re I mean regardless of how to look at them and uh, what uh, what what the morphology of them. And, and this was very powerful because uh, uh, it was already uh, in few years uh, um, <clears throat> already was applied into into pathology into medicine uh, try to to look at the different type of cells uh, in uh, in the epithelium in the cervical carcinoma and so forth um, mostly by uh, the evaluation of uh, how a cell uh, uh, what, what's the size of the cell and what's the DNA content on the cells, and so looking at dead versus live cells. So a, a, a pretty uh, wide uh, application into uh, medicine, particularly, and biology, of course. Uh, and then it developed, of course, as all the techniques, they developed throughout the years, uh, assuming more and more, uh, uh, um, uh, giving us more details uh, about... Uh, uh, our sample, and in this case, uh, it was invented a, a sorter uh, using the same technique as a printer, uh, so it, uh, a dot printer. So um, uh, selecting uh, uh, single particles that are flowing into a into a specific uh, let me actually show it to you into a specific device, which it's actually the real uh, real beginning of uh, of fax sorting and flow cytometry which nowadays are, of course, uh, semi-automated uh, machines, and they can divide it in two different uh, uh, groups. One is a, a, an analyzer, so it's a simple analyzer, so analyzes your cell in their content, whereas another one, it's more, much more complicated and, of course, expensive, which is a, a sorter, so something that separates a, different popula two, a, a big population of cells into separate populations, and the separation is uh, um, done by specific criteria that we'll, we'll go through uh, during the lecture, okay? So, <clears throat> what is a fax sorting? It's, uh, it's called uh, a fluorescent activated cell sorter, and uh, you will see throughout the lecture how, uh, what are the similarities to microscopy, uh, although uh, there are specific uh, um, uh, specific pitfalls um, that uh, uh, allow the microscopy and the sex sorting to be complementary one to each other, but not replacing one to each other. So uh, I'm going to go through details. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to go through details, but I'm going to go through um, what is the technique, or how the fax sorter work, uh, and then uh, looking at specific uh, technique that you may use in the near future. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> this is a schematic representation on how a cytometer or a sorter work. We have a cell preparation, so we have our cell uh, coming from culture cells or from uh, um, uh, biopsies. Um, we have fluidic, fluidic controls where where we uh, analyze the uh, media where the cells are. We have light source uh, that will uh, shine the cells into a chamber and a sorter that will separate them. And those are the detectors and analyze analyzers to 
get the data. In details, what the fax sorter is, is a device that pretty much allows you to stream the cells and the, and the sample into a, a machine that will uh, use optics, detectors, and uh, all the basic fluorescent uh, uh, criteria that we spoke last week uh, in order to count the cells, in order to separate them into different populations based on their content, based on their fluorescent, based on their size, and, and so forth. So basically, fluidics, analyzers, optics, and detectors are the four different components that you need to know in order to not only use a, so a flow cytometer, but also to set it up properly and therefore to get uh, a proper separation of cells. Let's start with the fluidics. As I said, you have a pool of cells that are coming from your culture and you need to um, put them in a media that will not alter their shape or will not kill them. Otherwise, everything is pretty much useless. So a fluidics, a fluidics are uh, components that you have, you need to consider uh, to, um, to do the proper analysis. Most of the time is normally PBS, so the most common, uh, um, the most common um, physiological solution. But there are some uh, cytometers, uh, flow cytometers, that require specific uh, uh, fluidics uh, uh, in order to um, separate the uh, cells in a, in a, properly. Um, as I said, yes, it's, it's PBS most of the time. Um, it's also called sheet fluid because it uh, allows the cell to lay down on a, on a, on a flat surface and um, allow the cell to move into a specific direction with a specific speed uh, and uh, to get uh, um, analyzed by the laser beam. This is a schematic representation, so we have our cells on the usually on the top of the of the chamber the cells are floating floating around nicely through the um, through the device and uh, aligning like a string of pearls pretty much and uh, each in every single point at some point actually they will uh, be counted by the laser now this is already shows you um one of the first uh, uh, problem that you may encounter with the flow cytometry, uh, which is the um, confluency, and more, more, more importantly, the speed of uh, the, your fluidics. If you have a very concentrated cell, uh, or a very concentrated sample of cells, um, a high flux will, allow, will risk will encounter the risk to have clumps. We'll get to this in a, in a, even later, but uh, to get clumps and therefore to alter the counting. Whereas a uh, uh, slower flux, 12, 15 microliter per minute, will allow a gen more gentle and more smooth uh, travel of your cells into the sorting. This uh, type of problem of clumps can also, um, I mean, can, can be fixed, of course, but uh, as uh, in every single uh, machine, it will uh, pretty much alter your data, so you need to start all over again. Uh, and uh, uh, can be fixed by um, um, measuring the pressure of the system and then me make sure that the system is properly uh, serviced and it, it, the, the usage of the of the system is uh, um, is done properly after the trainings and, and other and and the experts. You can 
there are a couple of ways to um, monitor if the flux is uh, uh, the proper flux or not, and usually this is automatically calibrated at the beginning. Um, but it's important to uh, to know what type of cells you are using and uh, what is the um, the settings on the machine. Let's look at the optics now. As in microscopy, we have uh, um, a series of lenses. I don't know if you remember one of those slides where we have a microscope in section and we saw all the different uh, lenses and, uh, and optics and glasses within the microscope. This is pretty much the same thing. Uh, we have a couple of mirrors uh, and, and, and filters that will filter the light uh, on a specific wavelength because one of the most important aspects of flow cytometry or fact sorting is the, the fact that all the cells need to be labeled somehow with a fluorescent dye in this case to make sure that uh, that fluorophore will give you light to get sorted into a specific population of cells. Okay, so optical elements again, it's important uh, are important to select a specific dye to use to stain the cell, and a specific laser to excite the dye. Lasers are more uh, basic uh, solid state lasers, collinear lasers. Um, not some of them are very similar to microscopy. Some of them are the same as microscopy, but uh, uh, the 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 selection of the laser is usually um, dependent on the type of. Of, uh, of application that you need to use, if it's a, um, a sorter or an analyzer or a more advanced uh, uh, high resolution and super resolution um, uh, application. Okay. Uh, we already looked through this uh, through a similar slide. Uh, the wavelength. Like in microscopy, the wavelength that are used are mostly within the 400, well, 350 to 750 nanometers, uh, going from the ultraviolet to the infrared. And uh, again, even here, um, uh, short wavelengths will give you high energy, so will give you high uh, uh, high reading. Uh, lower wavelengths will give you lower energy and. Uh, uh, and specific for, uh, for a specific type of cells, and it can be uh, bigger cells or can be um, clumps of cells that must be counted as a clump instead of a single one. Uh, I'm going to go very, very quickly in here. Uh, as a reminder, each fluorophore has an excitation and emission. The emission, uh, the excitation, sorry, is uh, the wavelength where. Um, the uh, the dye or the fluorophore can be excited in order to emit some light uh, in the most efficient way. And either emission or excitation have a, a range. So you can have a range of emission where the peak is the value where it is the the more the more. Um, the the most efficient um, uh, signal. Excitation and emission, as in microscopy, will have to be considered uh, in order to calculate the efficiency of uh, of your fluorophore. Some of the dyes are very efficient in terms of quantum yield, so how much energy they will release upon excitation. Some others are not as much. Uh, so you, it's always good to consider what type of dye, what is the, the selection of dye to use to stain your cells to get the best out of your uh, reading and out of your analysis. <coughs> 
inside the uh, the, 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 the flow cytometer, as in the microscope, there are different optical filters. Uh, and uh, also here, the knowledge, a, a proper knowledge of your fluorophore in terms of excitation and emission, it's important to, uh, uh, it needs to be considered to uh, be sure that the light is selected in the proper way. Some of the uh, flow cytometers has already this preset, but it's always good to know what are, what is the light path, what are the composition of the, 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 the filters within the light path to get the proper excitation and emission. And in this case, it's shown here in a very quick, brief example, long pass and short pass filters that are selecting the type of light that go through and then get, gets refracted, okay? Most of the time, we're talking about wide band pass filters where only the more, most common fluorophores can pass through and excite your cell in order to give you a wider range and therefore a better reading. But sometimes it's the, 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 the use of specific uh, wavelength is needed to avoid cross-talking to one to each other. <clears throat> and, uh, well, this is a more technical way to show how light is diffracted or reflected from, from a filter when it shines from a laser. So, we talk about fluidics, we talk about optics, quick mention of the PMTs, the photomultiplier plier tubes. Those are exactly the same as the one in microscopy. What do they do? is basically capture the light that is coming from your sample. They can, there are different way, different type of photomultipliers, photomultiplier tubes, depending on the machine, depending on the age of the machine, on the brand, and so forth. But most of the time, are, they detect the light coming from the, the sample after excitation from the laser. Uh, some of the flow cytometers, the cheapest one actually, they have uh, CCD cameras instead of uh, uh, PMTs. The CCD camera has a, has a chip similar to this one up here that uh, it's much less sensitive, so it's very easy to encounter to uh, mistakes and error on the separation of the cells. However, an ana uh, one analyzer may also hold a CCD uh, detector in order to analyze the type of cells that you have without need of any, any separation or any sorting. So how does it work? Let me go show you this one. It's actually. So basically the light, the photons from the light go inside the detector and it detects the, the, the photon are amplified inside the detector by a series of electronics that I'm, on, I'm, not, I'm not going into the details. And this amplification will allow a much, much uh, precise detection of your signal. Okay? That's why um, the, the, the PMTs... Uh, um, are mostly used in fact sorter and also in microscopy because they they don't they amplify compared to the uh, CCD um, cameras or detectors that are do not amplify but just capture the image. So let's go a little bit more into details. After the loading of the of, of our cells into the detector, the cells travels travel to a specific path, and at some point they get detected by the laser, giving or already giving a, a readout. By the time the path, the path, the, the cell passes through the laser, 
we have a readout that uh, reflects the intensity of the dye coming from the cell. Okay. Now, how do we how do we know that this cell is dead or alive, or it's a uh, big cells, or it's a slow cell, or it's a uh, uh, granulocyte or is a specific type of cells the mechanism that I showed you so far is basic for every single flow cytometer but then when you go into the details that you have a cell population pro potentially coming from a biopsy for a, for a cancer biopsy or something that you need to really make sure that you are separating the good cells from the bad cells or the dead cells from the live cells and so forth then you need a specific criteria. Criteria that uh, all the fax sorter um, and the flow cytometers um, are, uh, have developed in the year, and I'll show you in a second. I uh, just want to mention something. When I, I'm talking about flow cytometers and fax sorters, they are pretty much the same. I'm alternating the two, the two different uh, uh, terminologies, but it's pretty much the same, okay? Okay, so uh, the criteria that uh, those machines use is called scattering, okay? And there are two different, two different types of scattering. It's a side scatter and a forward scatter. So we have our cell, the light, it's coming from the laser. And our cell, being composed by different organelles, being composed by specific... Uh, um, uh, portion uh, and specific uh, um, uh, component of a cell, they can be scattered in a different way depending on what they are, what do they contain, and how big they are. Okay? In uh, details, we have a side scatter and a forward scatter. The, five, the side scatter, a side scatter, and a forward scatter. The, five, the side scatter is a, is a way to detect the shape, uh, the granularity, so how complex is the cell. If it's a very easy cell, very simple cell with just a nucleus and, and a very little cytoplasm like, like uh, um, stem cells, or if a uh, granulocyte, or if or it's a uh, megakaryocyte, and so forth. So we can detect based on granularity, or we can detect based on size. So the forward scatter will allow you to sort cells from uh, using their size. Um, as you remember, the everything that is that it involves lasers or lenses uh, needs to be considered um, with his refractive index, and that's why, especially for the granularity aspect, light scatter is dependent from the refractive index, especially because uh, it's uh, emerging the fluid, so the light path again goes from the laser filters, fluidics and then gets into the cell. So there are many different components inside the light path that will allow us to have a good reading or bad reading. A, a bad indication of um, a bad um, selection of your refractive index and therefore on your fluidics or the media will result in inaccuracies on the cell size. Okay. Let's look at the side scatter. <clears throat> so, the detection of the uh, of the granularity uh, reflects the internal complexity of the cell. Okay. So again, as, as I said, if the cell is really complex, then uh, it will be detected as uh, uh, with a specific number. 
if uh, if the cell is healthy and if the cell is a tiny cell with a large amount of uh, with a large uh, um, ratio nuclei, nuclei versus cytoplasm, then uh, would fit in a different categories. So it's uh, it's always good to know what type of cells are you expecting to see, and therefore to evaluate the, the type of cells after the, 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 the analysis. The analysis is actually what uh, is the most difficult part, because so far we culture our cells, we put on the fax sorter, we press go, and then the, the fax sorter does the job. You just look at it. Actually, if you look at to, it to, um, uh, people that are using fax sorting, they are always with the phone just checking every now and then the sorter because it does it by it works by itself. I mean what what the user needs to do is the analysis, is the looking at the data and looking at the route the output of the fax sorter and uh, make sure that whatever is giving you it makes some sort of sense. This is pretty much what you are going to have after uh, flow cytometer or fax sort of analysis. So it's a, it's a dot plot um, graph where you have a lot of dots coming out the readings of the machine. Okay? And again, you have your cell with your fluorophore attached. The fluorophore gives you an intensity of, um, after the excitation of the laser and the machine detects at that specific wavelength a number of cell, or uh, sorry, a, a specific uh, uh, um, reading for each single cell, okay? And each of them will be going into the graph. At the end, you're gonna have millions of cells fitting in a different area, that you will have to analyze properly and uh, by using, uh, again, um, a dot plot or a logarithmic scale or, or uh, sorry, a graph, a logarithmic graph where it shows the number of cells that are emitting on that specific wavelength or they are scattering on a specific way or they are side scattering or forward scattering and so forth. Usually, most of the time, the dot plot has forward scattering and side scattering on the two axes. So the dot will also tell you if uh, the value of the forward scattering is higher or lower and the value of the side scattering is higher or lower. And from then, you retrieve the information that you need. This is pretty much what I've what I told you. Uh, we have side scattered here and forward scattered here. So an increment in side scatter, meaning an increment in granular granularity, and an increment in uh, in this way in um, side. Therefore. You can have granulocytes in here. They are smaller, but they are really, really complex. Or lymphocytes in here. They are very, very simple and not that big. Okay. So based on the reading of your... Yes. So you may have the yeah. But how does the cell become fluorescent? Yes, um, the treatment uh, of the cell can vary depending on the different techniques. Uh, I'll give you some examples later, but just as a general rule, the cell would, can be live or can be dead, or actually the pool of cells can be live or dead. You can uh, label them with fluorescent dyes or they can uh, already have a GFP, a fluorescent protein in them. So it's just a matter of reading them uh, in the live case. Um, but most of the time, it's a dye. It's a specific dye 
that uh, will be uh, staining the cell for a specific compartment and uh, this dye will give you fluorescent depending on what type of excitation and emission uh, combination you use. Um, and about the life and death cells? Yes. Uh, so, usually you want to set up a time point. You have, uh, let's say you have a biopsy, right, uh, from, uh, from a patient. Cells out of this biopsy are all alive. Some of them are more complex than others, but some others are also dying. Okay, so at that time point, during the reading, you see that uh, the 20% of cells are dead, 60% are healthy, and the others are about to be dying, okay, at that time point. And then you said another time point where the cells, instead of the, the dead cells, instead of being 20% are 40% or 60% and so forth. So you have already a scale or a time timeline where you have uh, uh, an increment of dead cells, for instance. Okay, so it's, uh, it's time points, basically. Um, the majority of the, the majority of the application in fact sorting are actually for dead versus alive cells, uh, mostly based on the DNA content. We'll go through that uh, in a second, uh, but um, but yeah, pretty much uh, uh, depending on uh, on what time point you are you are setting, then it's then it's a, it's a reading. Any other questions? As, you, as I told you last time, please feel free to interrupt me anytime. I mean, I don't want to go ahead and uh, look in at faces. Uh, what is he talking about? Okay, so one of the things that uh, I found really um, tricky, I would say, in, uh, part of, in, in the flow cytometer is uh, what is called gating. Okay, so again, you have, you have a reading, and you have a bunch of dots here. You need to set different uh, areas to highlight the type of cells that you're looking for, and then do the statistical analysis and so forth. So, um, gating or creating a specific area where you're sure that your cells on that area belong to a specific category, it's very important, but it's very tricky at the same time because a, a wrong gating or a wrong selection of your area will allow you to screw up your data. Okay. This... Um, sorry. This... Uh, um, uh, the, the, the gating uh, approach must be done upon the magic word, the control. So we run controls, we run uh, fluorophore beads, we run uh, any sort of cell or any sort of dye that will give you a baseline so that the system is calibrated to, give, to have specific parameters in a specific area where then when you run your, 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 uh, your experimental uh, sample, whatever fits in there will be true. Okay. Uh, as I said at the beginning, it's um, flow, uh, flow cytometer and microscopy are similar, but in flow cytometry, you don't look at the cell. So the fluorescence that comes out of the cell is a fluorescence that comes out from the entire cell. You don't look if the fluorescence is in the nucleus, in the mitochondria, in the organelles, and so forth, but you busy much look at the entire fluorescence of the cell, okay? Um, and more importantly, uh, it tells you where uh, if the cell is emitting any fluorescence or not, but not where. 
Um, I'll skip this one and this one. This is the old, I think I load my old presentation anyways. Um, okay. So, in the gating process, you need, to, I mean, oh, as I said, you need to run the control and beads, floor of four beads, to make sure that your gating is properly done. Also because you encounter a lot of noise on the background. Again, we are not talking about super resolution microscopy or any kind of fancy microscopy where you are looking at the details without any background. In here you see all the fluorescent coming in the set. So you may encounter noise on the back. And that's why uh, I'm setting up uh, proper setup of the of the system will allow you to catch only the value that is related to the cell, ignoring and avoiding any other background noise. Most of the time, this is do uh, this is done by the setting up of of the real event and setting up by fluoro beads, um, fluoro microspheres that have a very, very bright signal and they don't have any sort of uh, artifact on the back, on the background. So the reading of the fluoro beads is the actual reading that the, the machine will calculate. Whereas a cell can, be a, a, can give you a lot of background due to his conformation, due to the fact that it's uh, uh, um, labeled in a wrong way or, or any other artifact that a uh, biological sample can give you. Okay. <clears throat> I'm gonna have a five minutes break and then we're gonna talk through two different applications. One is the DNA staining and uh, another one is um, exocellular vesicles, okay? Any questions, please, please, please? Just throw them on the, here, the side. Unless you want to keep going to finish earlier, it's up to you. I'm happy to get a five minutes break. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Cool.